I haven't spoke in front of an unfamiliar crowd since college in 1989. And uh, the professor felt pity, gave me a passing grade, but I guarantee I didn't deserve it. <coughs> so, the idea of distributed systems, it just provides you with this tapestry of complexity and rewards. I remember the first class I had in distributed systems, I just thought, I just marveled at the idea of being able to author this federation of, of services and lob it out into this network of resources and have it accomplish an otherwise impossible or at least impractical task. So I'm hoping that this presentation will give you three things. Um, one, I'd like to talk about some common communication needs of distributed systems. Two, maybe introduce you to a new tool that helps satisfy those needs, namely Zero and Q. And three, if you leave with an enthusiasm and you go out there and build something really cool, I'd take it a big win. So before you embark on your journey with Google, uh, it's important to understand that Zero and Q goes by a variety of names or spellings. Um, it oftentimes is just Zero and Q or the numeric Zero and Q, and oftentimes just ZMQ, which you'll see instances of. Uh, the official site is http zeroq.org. I would uh, highly recommend that you go there if you're interested because a big chunk of the content that came from these slide decks came directly from that site. Real brief origin story. Um, JP Morgan Chase, they had financial transaction systems, distributed tra financial transaction systems, and they're getting uh, 10,000 messages a second but they felt a need to, to, to get to 100,000. And the way that they felt that they were gonna accomplish that is they authored this brand new protocol, OpenAMQ. And they needed a C implementation, and that's actually when they hired Peter Hitchkins to come and implement the C implementation. Um, but Peter, in time, he started to feel that the AMQ community was toxic, and one of the rules that he, he, he led his life by was don't try to fix organizations, instead start new ones. So you return to IMADIX with a focused development of, of this new product known as Zero and Q. And that's when he, he, he partnered with uh, Martin Sustic. Now both of them were experienced software engineers, uh, but each in time kind of carved out their own um, uh, emphasis. Uh, Martin was a very accomplished uh, developer, primarily in communication frameworks, so he's by most rights the chief architect of Zero and Q. And Peter felt that uh, the way to have a successful product is you have to have a community to, to hold it up, if you will. Um, and unfortunately, in, in time, they had a pretty significant difference of opinion, and they both left. So Martin went and started a brand new product called NanoMessage. And it was, uh, by all rights, not nearly as popular as Zero and Q, and that may enforce the, the uh, the, the opinion of Peter that you have to have a community to kind of stand behind this, this product. So, what is Zero and Q? Goes by a variety of names. One of my favorite is sockets on steroids. Um, a more comprehensive definition would probably be a communication framework you, used to build robust distributed systems. What you'll find in distributed systems, they have a, a, a pretty well defined um, pattern of the types of communication needs. Oftentimes they need remote procedure call, bi-directional communications, and other times they just need unidirectional communications like uh, pub sub or even pipelines. And we'll see instances of those in the following slides. So Zero and Q is intended to satisfy these needs. It is multi-language, so as of uh, the last time I looked, they had 52 languages. Obviously we will be looking at Python, which is one of them, for obvious reasons. It is multi-platform, so they, they say that it runs on everything of interest, but not limited to Windows and Linux and Mac, pretty much embedded in some of the mobile devices. It's also multi-transport. The examples that we'll see in the following slides are using TCP, but it also supports UDP, IPC, NPROC, and PGM and EPGM, which are reliable multicast protocols. So some of the core concepts of Zero and Q was kind of born out of the financial industry. And that's relevant because, you know, we're talking about high volume, high reliability um, uh, communication needs. And when, as, a company, as open source products kind of go, it's extremely well documented in my opinion. Um, they've got a very comprehensive user guide. 
that talks about the variety of different languages with working examples. Um, it's got an RFC standard defined, and that greatly enables the, the ability to actually develop the alternative languages. And what it gives you is a library plus what we'll refer to as like common distributed system recipes or patterns. The, and it's kind of important to know that this, this comes as a library. So this is not like uh, other communication frameworks you may be accustomed to where, you know, like open uh, Apache MQ. You first install your libraries and then you have to set up your broker because your broker is, is required or it's a, at, its, at the core of the uh, uh, communication system. Um, Zero MQ actually is fully capable with just the libraries. You don't actually need a broker um, to, to do simple communications. So you can ask, you know, so what does a zero stand for? Well, zero broker, because it is a library and you can do peer-to-peer -peer right out of the gate, it doesn't require a broker service, but on the other hand, if you need one, you can implement one in about 10 lines of code. You can say that it stands for zero latency because it, it does have a very small framing protocol and it's incredibly fast and efficient. In fact, it's fast enough that you can consider using this in more atypical needs. For instance, just inner process or inner task communications, it certainly will satisfy those uh, types of, of uh, communication needs. Something that you probably wouldn't consider with a more heavyweight um, uh, uh, communication framework. One could say that it stands for zero cost. They kind of adopt this Formula One design model where you first try to make the communications fast and then you can add layers of reliability <coughs> on top of it as needed. And you could make a case that it stands for zero waste because the ability of deploying these services on available hardware um, gives you the ability to actually reduce the need for specialized hardware and, as a result, uh, reduce waste. So I've got two slides on design considerations, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but this is basically in, in place because I want to try to explain how, if you're to do this with just raw sockets, what types of things you'd have to take into account. And then I'm going to contrast it with how Zero MQ is actually doing it. So how are you going to handle I.O.? Well, with raw sockets, I think everybody's relatively familiar with that. The way that Zero and Q does it is they introduce a background communication engine with, with the socket, inherent to the socket, and internal queues. And then it allows you to, to, to truly implement like an asynchronous message. It's literally fire and forget. Um, and we'll see examples of that a little bit later. How are you going to handle dynamic components? Again, raw sockets. And by dynamic components, I mean what the services that are online and then maybe offline. For reasons of, you know, maybe they intentionally come online as the system demands require, or, or worse, even uh, terminate unexpectedly and leave you hanging. A lot of the time, you can convince yourself that dynamic components are, are a bad thing because of the complexity you have to deal with. Uh, having to, to retry connections when a, when a service is no longer available and retry sending, it just comes with this plethora of, uh, of complexity that just starts riddling your, your, your uh, business logic and code. But what if you had a communication framework that does that for you? And that's precisely what the background communication engines do. If a node becomes unavailable, uh, but it's a destination for a message, the background communication engine will continue to retry to try to reconnect and then deliver the message when it can. So it greatly reduces the complexity on your client code. Again, raw sockets, one of the questions, what, how am I going to represent this message on the wire? Well, with zero MQ, it's literally a length, a payload, uh, I'm sorry, an envelope and a payload. There is no imposed uh, protocol, it's just a, a blob, just bytes. So you can bring your own protocol along with you if you choose to use JSON or strings or Google Protobuf, whatever. Um, that's, that's not inherent or, or constrained by the, uh, by the framework. And then uh, what if you can't deliver the message in, in, uh, immediately? So imagine you're sending this massive message and it's uh, spanning over multiple packets and half of it arrives. Well, what, a, what a drag that can be, from, both from the sender and the receiver's perspective. So the protocol itself, Zero MQ, guarantees what they refer to as a tonic delivery. The message is either going to arrive in its entirety or not at all. So that, again, reduces the complexity from the client code. And I'm just going to skip over much of these, but these are the types of things you'd have to consider if you're trying to develop your own protocol or, or going to use raw sockets. But 
What about uh, alternative languages? So what if you were going to design a system and you require alternative languages? How would you do that? Well, zero and Q defines the RFC, and you got 50 languages uh, and counting. So we're going to move on to socket types. I think three more slides, and I promise we'll see code. Good luck to you back there reading it. <laughs> um, so zero and Q redefines the term socket. A lot of us will, will probably think of the socket as just a file descriptor, but it's much more than that with zero and Q. Um, it, and we, we talked about every socket has a background communication engine, as well as internal cues, and I refer to it as a personality or a pattern, if you will. So they've got pub, sub, request, reply, router, dealer, push, pull, and a pair. These are different types of uh, patterns that satisfy normal commu uh, distributed communication needs. And we'll see examples of those in one more slide. But before you start developing your uh, distributed system, it's always in your best interest to sketch it up. And pay attention to how many nodes you're, you're expecting, the, the number of connections between your nodes, and the directionality in particular. And the value is, you know, other than uh, you can't just build a system before understanding it, it also allows you to pick the most appropriate communication pattern. So bi-directional communications in the RFC manner will lend themselves to a specific personality more than unidirectional with multi-destinations. Multi <coughs> Finally, we'll get to our first bit of code. Uh, I apologize, you're not going to be able to see it, but 16 lines of code for the publisher and the subscriber. Um, and I, I, if you're likely familiar with this, but pub-sub, unidirectional communication, it's often referred to as an observer pattern. Uh, it can be viewed as a radio broadcast, whereas the, if the subscribers are available, they will hear the message as it's being transmitted. And if they're not available, it's lost in the ether. So, pub on top, sub on the bottom, a lot of commonality between the code. And before we step into it, each one of these examples uh, takes in from the command line argument a uh, port. So I'm just going to say it, port 5000 for uh, as we walk through this example. So line three imports the MQ. We get, uh, get our port from line seven. Then we create a context followed by creating our socket, which is a publisher in this particular case. And we bind to TCP, that's the protocol this is using, colon slash slash star colon 5000. And the star implies that I'm going to accept on any Ethernet device, whether it's local, host, 127.0.0.1, uh, ETH0 through N, or your, your uh, wireless. It'll accept it anywhere. If you want to constrain that, replace the star with ETH0. Um, we say that we're going to publish topic XX, and then we enter into a while loop where we essentially just send our topic with a numeric between 1 and 100. We sleep for a second and go again. The subscriber looks similar in nature. Uh, import ZMQ, we get the, the, the port um, on line 9, 5000 again. We create a socket, a subscriber in this case, and we connect to TCP colon slash slash localhost port 5000. We finally uh, uh, subscribe to the topic XX, and then we enter in our while loop where we receive the message and print it out, receive it and print it out. So this short example um, can quickly demonstrate the value of this over, say, raw sockets, just by your initialization <coughs> order. For instance, in a typical fashion, you would launch your, your publisher, it would bind to the port, and then you'd launch your subscriber and it would connect. Everything's, everybody's happy at that point in time, right? And it, um, but what if you actually inverted that and started your subscriber first? With raw sockets, you do a connect, uh, the server isn't, the, or the publisher in this case, isn't available, and it blows up. So then you introduce this retry policy, and retry policy, and retry policy, right? It starts muddying your code with that. But in this particular case, you're using zero and Q, you can launch your subscribers first or last. It makes no difference. Um, so that's the value of having this background communication engine that, uh, you know, um, reestablishes connections uh, when they're no longer available, implements that retry policy. So this is a one-to-one -one, um, pub-sub pattern. If you're gonna do it from one to N, there's absolutely no changes. The only difference, I guess, would be you'd launch your subscribers multiple times, they both connect to port 5000, and everybody's happy. 
But as powerful as the uh, pub sub pattern is, that's not necessarily sufficient for all day uh, distributed system needs. Um, in a lot of cases, you require bi-directional communication for like a, 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 a remote procedure call. And that, that's really the, the, the focus of the request reply um, pattern or uh, socket pair. It enforces the send and receive protocol. So uh, after you sent a message, you have to receive a message, even if it's uh, even if it's a blank return or a, 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 a empty string return. So a lot of similarity from this in the pub sub. We're going to go over the client first. Again, we do the import and the port, and then we create a request socket. We connect to TCP localhost 5000. We sleep, we send, we receive, and everybody's happy. Um, the server, very similar as, as well, except it creates a reply socket. It receives first and then sends a response. Now much like the pub sub, again, you can launch these in any particular order. And really, the, um, you're not really locked until, I guess, you, you enter line nine where you're receiving. Because it, you know, the retry policy is still going to go um, but obviously you're not going to receive any response until your server is actually brought online. If you want to implement the same thing, request reply across multiple servers. This is a very impractical slide, but it's, it's intended to demonstrate something that can be very uh, useful in, in, uh, with additional uh, um, patterns. Notice that I take in two ports here, port 5000 and 5001. I create one socket, a request, but I connect to 5000 and 5001. Same, same socket, but I got two endpoints. And that's perfectly acceptable. Um, then we enter into the, 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 our while loop and send a message and receive. Now, if our, and same, same goes for, I'm sorry, server is identical as, as the last one. But if I launch this twice, server 5000 and 5001, what you would see is the client send a message back and forth. And this is what they refer to as fair queuing or just round robin. And I say that this is very impractical because you would have to have both servers up and running in order for your client not to stall out, right? But with other patterns, you can introduce um, like dynamic servers joining and only getting messages after they've joined. And if they drop out, not getting uh, messages, adding heart beating and the like. So some of the advanced patterns kind of build off of this fair queuing model. So we, we've looked at a couple of very simple um, topologies. Uh, this request from Pi is kind of end to end, so you can absolutely implement this. This would be no, no problem implementing it. The trouble is, all of a sudden you have to deal with all these port numbers, and that can be error, error prone or clumsy or whatever you prefer. Same is true with pub sub. Just keeping track of all the port numbers can be uh, burdensome. So the way that you can implement that is you introduce an inter intermediary, this proxy or by all rights a, a, a broker. It's the whole purpose of brokers, right? And you establish a singular port on either endpoint. And the way that you do that is you, you introduce a new process, about 10 lines of code, and you connect your publishers to these X pub X sub sockets. And now you have the same topology as most uh, distributed systems where you've got two well-defined ports, your port management becomes much less complex, and the proxy just basically routes the messages as, appropriate, as, as needed. So this is a publisher, but you can absolutely do the same thing with, with the uh, request reply. The only difference is we use a router-dealer pairing to satisfy that. Um, so that's how you, you can build using these primitive types with zero and Q and build uh, your system uh, as needed as opposed to uh, coming in with a, a, a very uh, sophisticated framework. Um, one last one, no code, but another distributed system communication needs is often like a push-pull where you have a single source, single sync. Imagine taking a problem set and divide and conquer, right? So I send out like an image and I send some images to my workers that do some analysis. They're received at the same point and reassembled. So that's a one-way communication um, that uh, is another pattern that is supported by zero and two. Sorry, I don't have an example. Um, you couldn't read it anyway from back there. Um, 
So we talked about like the robust communication engine and what that actually does for you. And it adds, you know, robustness with respect to sending and receiving messages. But um, uh, there are many times when you actually need more advanced patterns. For instance, like the request reply that we talked about. Uh, say you sent a message and when it was received by the, the server, it just blows up. Well, the client is still gonna be hanging, waiting for that response, right? And the way that you can address that is you add new patterns to satisfy that um, with failover or heart beating. And these are kind of examples of some of the patterns that add, you know, heart beating and failover and uh, load balancing types of patterns. And just by the name, you know, the paranoid pirate and the simple pirate, it's come out of the, the, the uh, um, user guide. So even if you never build anything with zero MQ, but you're interested in just uh, distributed systems, uh, or or you just up for a little read. This is a very entertaining document. Are, are those common terms, or is that just straight out of zero MQ? I've only out? seen it at zero MQ. I've never seen those terms elsewhere, cool. uh, except for maybe major dorm, major domo. Okay. I think I've seen that elsewhere. But um, yeah, I, I truly believe that. I think uh, Peter just had a very dry sense of humor. Probably something we could all relate to. Um, so quick summary, this is a library-based high-performance uh, messaging framework. It's multi-language, <coughs> multi-platform, multi-transport. The messages are blobs, so you bring your own protocol along with you. Um, everything can be used as asynchronous message delivery because of the background communication engine. Uh, it can satisfy anything from like quick peer-to-peer -peer communications uh, with as massive of a distributed system as, as you can possibly imagine. It does have advanced patterns for some uh, additional uh, distributed system challenges. It's got a ton of documentation and a pretty uh, uh, supportive community. community. Um, it's definitely worth a read. And I guess I'd invite you to go build something cool with it. Last slide. The slides will be available here if you're at all interested. Um, uh, I work for FSK Consulting, that is our site. I have a blog that I, if you're ever interested in what shenanigans I'm up to, and as, <laughs> as you had mentioned, the uh, Slack channel, I, I go under lapel GM. Uh, that is it real fast.